and, and uh, we went through different aspects of normally what I go through with premarital counseling uh, with couples uh, last year. And, but this year the Lord has a little bit different, where we're going to focus a little bit different uh, this morning just for this one Sunday. But before we read our text for today from 1 Corinthians, I want to ask, how many of y'all remember this yellow poster board here with this love triangle? How many of y'all have been here long enough to have seen it? All right, some of you have been here long enough to have seen it. Uh, well, this is the secret uh, to a marriage. And this is normally the first thing that I talk about uh, with couples whenever it comes to, to marriages. And this, this love triangle uh, right here. We're going to talk about it uh, for just a couple of moments as we uh, talk on love, on love this morning. It takes three to have a successful marriage. It takes three. Is it husband, wife, and mother-in-law? No. Is it husband, wife, father-in-law? No. It is husband, wife, and God. It takes three to have a successful marriage. Husband, wife, and God. The marriage will not work outside of that. And just because you saw this triangle, maybe I've probably brought it out three years in a row now, but at some point last year, the year before, maybe there was no trouble in the relationship that you're in. But this year you find that things are a little bit different. So I ask you to pay attention or maybe you can help someone who is struggling in their marriage uh, today. But uh, anyway, it's the secret to a happy marriage, this triangle. God designed marriage, and He knows how marriage should work much better than you do. He knows how marriage should work, work more than any psychologist or psychiatrist. God knows because He designed marriage, and it will not work without Him in it. And uh, some of you here today may find yourselves tolerating each other for the sake of the kids. Some of you may be staying together for financial reasons, sleeping under the same roof because your parents don't approve of divorce. So if you're miserable in your marriage today, I ask you to listen up. If you desire to see improvement in your marriage today, listen closely. If you want your marriage to get better, husband, if you want to be closer to your wife, listen carefully. Wife, if you feel distant from your husband today, listen carefully. Again, the only way that a marriage can work is for a husband and a wife to seek God together. That's the only way that it can work. I want you to notice this triangle for just a second. <coughs> Here's the husband, here's the wife, for those that can't see. I wonder if we might can point the camera on this so that folks at the back might can see a little better. But uh, here's the husband, here's the wife, and here's God at the top. And so as we, if you notice something, as the husband seeks God, as the wife seeks God, this is the distance between the husband and the wife. So if you have the husband and the wife and God up here, what happens as the husband and the wife are seeking God? Can you see what happens there? The distance between the husband and the wife. What happens? They get closer to each other. The husband, wife, God. As they seek God, they can't help but to get closer to each other. That's the way it works in a relationship. So there's a distance there. Husband, wife, but if you seek God, you'll get closer to each other. If you don't believe me, you try. Husband, you start reading your Bible every day. Wife, you start reading your Bible every day, and you will see why I'm saying it's true. The love triangle is the secret to a successful and happy marriage. And the reason, I'll say this, the reason for every single divorce, every single divorce is because either one or both, husband and or wife, move away from God. When you move away, as you move closer, you get closer together. But if you move away from God, you get further, further from your husband, your wife, whichever one is moving away. So that is the key. That's the secret. <coughs> so this morning, if you're not as close to your spouse as you'd like to be, if you're not as close to your husband and wife as you think you should be, then you need to first evaluate yourself Ask yourself, am I the one? Is it me? Am I the one who is moving away from you that is causing me to drift away from my spouse? You need to ask yourself that again. Your marriage will not work without God. 
God. I'm going to say that again. I hope everybody will hear that and understand that. Your marriage will not work outside of God. It won't work. And that's the key to marriage. It's having God. If you don't have God, it will not work. Now I'm going to read from a different translation today so that the words we normally read from King James, as you know. But I want the words to really sink into our hearts this morning. And sometimes when we read this part of the King James, we have to do a lot of thinking about what it's saying. And so we'll read from the Holland translation. But as we read this scripture today, let us give ear. Let us give attention not to be informed, but transformed by what God says about love. About love. If we could do this, then our marriages would be transformed, our relationships with our parents, our children, our relatives, our very lives would be transformed if we allow God to plant the seed of love in us today. You see, without love, life is worthless. Love is worth it. And that's the title of today's message. And Paul says in verse 3, If I sold everything that I have and give to the poor, or if I burned out for Jesus but did not have love, then it profits me very little. It profits me nothing. I gain nothing doing things without love. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning with verse 4. Again, I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Is not boastful. Is not conceited. Does not act improperly. Is not selfish. Is not provoked. And does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. So as we think about love, I love my wife. I love my children. I love you all my church family. I love to eat good food. Cheeseburgers are probably one of my favorites. I, I love tracking the weather, especially when there's a little bit of excitement like this, this coming week. There are a lot of things that I love. I love this. I love that. But there's a problem. When we, when we start using the word love so freely, we start using it so freely that we sort of dilute, we water down it's me. And we tend to love so many different things. As I said, that what is more special than the other thing? But the Greeks didn't have this problem like you and I do in the English language. They used four different words for love. One word was used for affection. For instance, I love my puppy or I love my cat at home. That's one kind of love that they had in the Greek. Another one was a love that referred to sexual, physical love. A third was brotherly love. Basically, if you're nice to me, then I'll be nice to you. So the Greeks knew the difference between loving their puppy, <coughs> loving their wife, or loving their neighbor. There was a difference there. They had different words. But none of these is the type of love that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. That's agape love, which is unconditional love. That's the love that Paul is referring to here. Agape is a love that gives simply for the sake of giving, never expecting anything in return. Agape love is committed and it gives value to someone or something, not necessarily what an individual deserves, but based on what you choose to give value, what value you choose to assign to that thing, to that individual. For instance, in this box is my granddaddy Jeff Ray's cufflinks, shirt cufflinks, and they've got the initials J.R. on them on these cufflinks here. And he died on September 30th, 1988. So uh, he's gone to be with the Lord and been there for a number of years now. Now if I try to take these cufflinks that I have in my hand up to the Springfield market or to some yard sale, they probably would say with the initials JR on them. Who would want cufflinks with the initials JR on them? They would say. However, to me, they are special. They're special to me. I have assigned value to them. I personally have assigned value to these cufflinks. They don't deserve to be valued high. They're not worth anything to anybody else. 
but I have chosen to assign a value to these uplinks. You see, people who don't know the Lord can experience all of these loves. They can love their puppy. They can love their spouse. That they can love their neighbor. But a God they love is only found in God. You can't begin to love how love is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 without Christ in your life. What do I mean? In the year 1647, during England's Civil War, a desert and Cromwell's army was captured and brought before him. He said, when the curfew bell sounds tonight, you shall be executed. That's what he told this man. But that night, the bell was not heard. While investigating, it was discovered that this man's fiancé had made her way into the camp and, and climbed up that bell tower and hid it there. And as curfew near, she positioned herself within the bell such a way that when that rope was pulled, the clamor hit her body. It kept hitting her body rather than the inside of the bed. Then, seeing her bruised and battered body, Cromwell was deeply touched by her love that the soldier's life was spared. Folks, I want you to know this morning that Jesus Christ climbed not a bell tower, but He climbed the hill of Calvary and endured the beating and was crucified so that you and I would be spared the execution that you deserve and I deserve this morning. These couplings, like these couplings, we might not mean much to others. You might not mean much to others at all. But Jesus valued your life so much. He valued your soul so much that He died for you. He climbed Calvary's hill. He died on that cross. Shed His precious blood for you. He assigned a high value to you because He loved you. Man. The world, with all of its sin this morning, the world, with all of its sin against God, did not deserve to be loved by God. We sin against God. We curse God. God's name is profane every single day. And as he looked at this world, he knew beforehand how the world would treat him. He did. But he chose to value this world. He chose to value you and me. So in comes John 3.16. Say it with me. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is a God they love. You didn't deserve to be loved. You haven't earned any love, but God loves you anyway. And that is a God. That's love that gives. That is sacrificial love. So I ask you men this morning, I ask you ladies this morning, do you have a agape love in you? A beautiful marriage. How beautiful it is when a husband and a wife love each other like that. How wonderful and fulfilling are your relationships with others when you love like that. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. Close your eyes. Everybody all the sanctuary, close your eyes. I want you to think about your relationships. Again, let the Word of God sink in. Think about your relationships. Is there any strife today between you and your spouse? What about you and your parents? You and your brothers or sisters? Any strife with children, friends? Between you and the Lord? What is the state of these relationships? And I'm going to call out a list of words. Keep your eyes closed. I want you to think about which set of words best describes the people that you love today. Those that are significant to you, those that are important, those individuals that you love today, those that you care about the most. I want you to, which word or words best describes your relationship with them? Conflict, confrontation, clashing, friction, Rivalry, coldness, competition, squabbling, or would your relationships be more like adoration, affection, warmth, intimacy, devotion, captivated, closeness? You may open your eyes now. Is there someone that you care about today? Your relationship is torn. Relationships, home. 
How different would our homes be today? How different would our family gatherings be today? How different would our church services be? How different would our workplace environments be? How different would our very lives be in this world that we live in if everyone loved when they got their love? Folks, love is worth it. Love people. You say, how do I do that? What is love? What does it look like? Well, Paul tells us. And as I read this, ask yourself this question, am I loving like this? Is the reason that I have torn broken relationships in my life because I am not loving the person or persons that I'm at odds with like this? Let the Word of God speak to you. Listen closely again. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love is not boastful. Love is not conceited. Love does not act improperly. Love is not selfish. Love is not provoked. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Is that the kind of love that you have, that you possess? Is that the kind of love that you show towards others? I'm not just talking about your spouse here. Are you patient, kind to your spouse, to your children, those you work with? Do you keep a record of wrongs? Back in 1963, you did this to me and I had forgotten you. How do we love? As we prepare for the invitation this morning, I told you I'd be brief today. As you evaluate your relationships, the closeness you have or that you don't have this morning with family and friends? Do you need to change how you're looking at the situation? Have you been retaliated when someone wrongs you or, or are you remaining patient and kind with them? Is the reason why there are problems with some people in your life due to jealousy or pride? Is your marriage failing because of selfishness on your part or, or both of your parts of, and both of you want your own way instead of showing the sacrificial love that we talked about? Maybe there's fighting and, and bickering and, and you're keeping a list of wrongs as we said. You're constantly bringing up these past hurts and failures of the ones that you love. Folks, love is worth it. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures. And I stress that. Endures all things. It does not give up. Maybe you come this morning and rededicate your life. Maybe a husband and wife will come and rededicate their relationship to each other and to the Lord today. Dear man, husband, God has given you a wife. You love her. A marriage can only work with three. Husband, wife, and God. It won't work any other way. You can try it, but you'll fail. Maybe someone here is concerned over a relationship that is strained today. Perhaps it's been strained for some while, for some time now, and you just want to come pray. And you've been praying, but, but this talk of love and, and showing love in a different way, this agape love, you'd say, maybe I haven't been doing that to try to reconcile this relationship. And, and you want to do your part. You want to pray for not only them, but you want to pray for you as well. To reconcile this relationship. To be able to show this agape love. What a day to speak on love with baptism coming. Baptism is a beautiful picture of agape love. It's a beautiful picture. God assigned value to our lives when we didn't deserve it. He climbed up Calvary's hill for you when you didn't deserve it. That is love. Nobody loves you more than He does. You say that you might be sitting there saying nobody loves me. Oh yes, there is somebody who loves you. Jesus Christ loves you and He died for you. He loves you if nobody else does. You know, I could probably picture the devil might be, would have said to Christ, say to Christ, see how awful those humans treat you? See how they spit on you? See how they curse you? See how they hate you? See how they lie about you? See how they use you over and over and over again? See how selfish they are? See how they take credit for everything you have done? Why would you die for their ungrateful souls? Couldn't you see Satan trying to tease and taunt Jesus Christ like that? And he would reply, I love him.
because love is worth it. And I love them because they are mine. They're mine. I wonder this morning, do you love Him? Do you love Him? If the love of Christ is in you, then you will strive to love like this. Love is worth it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Is not boastful. Is not conceited. Does not act improperly. Is not selfish. Is not provoked. And does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for these few moments to share on love. Father, we know that your example is the ultimate sacrifice. Love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. And Lord, we'll spend the endless ages praising and thanking You for that. Father, perhaps there's someone here this morning. You know who they are. They know it as well. There's a relationship. It might be a spouse. It might be a family member. It might be a friend. But there's a relationship that's torn. And Lord, instead of doing our part to, to reconcile, to show a God they love. We've been retaliating. We've been uh, fighting back. We've been bickering. We've, bickering. we've been as much as the problem as they have. But Father, I pray that this morning that we would commit to show a God they love. To love others unselfishly. To love others sacrificially. To give without expecting anything in return. Oh Lord, change our hearts. Show us how to love others. Lord, again, we thank you, O Holy Spirit, go up and down these aisles and among these pews. Speak to our hearts about love. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask you if you'll stand at this time to start for rededication to come unite this church by state of faith transfer letter from the confession of Jesus Christ. As your Lord and Savior, you come to Michael, uh, Michael, you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Are you trusting Him now as your own personal Lord and Savior? Upon your profession of faith, and by divine command of Christ Jesus our Lord, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Bear with Him in baptism, like unto His death, raised to walk in new.